Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our new book today, The Exodus. This is the, um, in the Greek, it means the going forth or going out. Going where? Into the promised land. We're, this is a play on where we're at today. We're about to enter that promised land. We're in that generation of the fig tree. And these were examples of how it would be at that time. Um, the Hebrew name, of course, is in the first, very first sentence of the book. These are the names, which is Viela Shemoth in the Hebrew tongue, which, which means these are the names. It's about those children, they're going out, their offspring, and how they were blessed. God, in the 15th chapter of Genesis, in verse 13, he had told them even then, way ahead of time, and he said unto Abram, that was Abraham's name before it was changed, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Long period of time. And also, that nation whom they shall serve, will I judge, and afterward they shall, shall they come out with great substance. In other words, they're going to come out a lot richer than they went in. That's God's way of doing things. When God is with you, but God helped the nation that tries to drive God out of it. I don't care what army you are. I don't care what people you are. You leave God out of the equation, and you're going to go down. That's the way our Father operates. He's still on the throne. It's always a good idea to try at least halfway to please him whereby you receive his blessings. So there we have it. This is the book of redemption, of, of um, claiming the children and, and blessing them. This is the way you come out. This is the way you go forth. Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. And these are the names, that's the Hebrew name, the Ela Shemoth, uh, of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob. Verse 2, Reuben, Simon, Levi, and Judah, and uh, Ishak, verse 3, Ishakar, Zebulon, and Benjamin. Verse 4, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. 5, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. For Joseph was in Egypt already. Joseph had been sold by his brothers when God put prophecies upon Joseph until the brothers became jealous. And sure enough, it was that he ended up in Egypt, and he saved Egypt. God let him know that there was a famine coming for a seven-year period, and he built granaries and stored food. And he saved Egypt, but not only Egypt, his own people who would come to purchase grain there. Verse 6, And Joseph died, <clears throat> and all of his brethren, and all that generation. Time marches on. Verse 7, and the children of Israel were, faith, were uh, fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. God always takes care of his own. They, they, were, they were driven. They were hardworking. And do you know something? Hardworking always brings health and fitness. Verse 8, now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Many think this was Ramesses, others think uh, the second, that is to say, and some think others. It doesn't matter. He was the new Pharaoh, uh, changed families, 
and now marching on. It's still the captivity. Verse 9. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. He's getting a little bit nervous. He said, They're so healthy, so vivacious, that if they should turn on us, and it's making him very, very nervous. Verse 10. Come on, or listen now. Let us deal wisely with them. Let's, let's be um, diplomatic. Okay, that's what wisdom in politic, politics does. Let's, let's be diplomatic about this. Lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out in any war, they uh, join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up and out of the land. We'll lose them. Better workers we've never had. We don't want to lose them. So uh, naturally, he's making every effort to squelch the population, try to bring it back under control, and uh, so it is. Verse 11. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasured cities, Python, that's the, the um, city of the sun, and Ramesses, the child of the sun. They, the more and more they built and built, and what a blessing it was to Egypt. Verse 12, But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. When God is with you, you can't go wrong. That's why it's so important to please him. And hope it pleases your fellow citizens. If it doesn't, always stick with God, not the citizenry. Always be pleasing to God, and that will be pleasing to friends that are worth having. Because with God, you're going to be blessed and uh, pleasing to him. And usually you will, even though times can be a little rough, you'll win most every battle. Verse 13, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. This word rigor uh, means um, to the, a crushing, crushing. I mean, they were really um, coming down on them, just inhuman almost. And still, the harder you work, most usually, if you're eating well, the healthier you're going to get. But so, but it would be easy to say that and leave God out of the equation. We do not want to do that because God was strengthening them. God was securing them. God was blessing them. This, this is why this book is an example of today. When you think the governments are coming down rigorously upon you, when you think times are that way, just be thankful that God is on your side, that he is with you. He'll, he'll always, just as he took care of these children, um, these are the names. The names of what? God's children. Is your name on that list? Of course it is if you love him, if you follow him. And, and within that, he takes the enemy as, as nothing compared to the love of Almighty God and taking care of his own. They can order rigorous, rigorous, rigorously, make it tough. Crushing is what the word translates better in English. And, um, and so it is. Let's go with the next verse, 14. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of services in the field all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. It was just crushing. Did that bother them? Of course it, 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 um, it was cruel, but they were children of God. God knew they were going there. This is why Egypt will pay. Egypt was promised by God they would always be a base nation, meaning a small nation. They have been even up to this day because God always keeps his word. But sometimes he's not happy with them. 
but because Israel could lean upon them a little bit, um, uh, then he uh, certainly allowed that base nation to always be there. Verse 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Sifra, and that means uh, brightness, and the name of the other was Shua, which means splendid. These were, these were women that delivered babies, of which the, the uh, title still carries to this day, midwives, 16. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, this is even in the Hebrew tongue, it means the stones, okay? If it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. And so it is. This was the order of the king. And uh, befitting as it was, he intended to stop the explosion that God was creating by blessing this people. They were, they were in numbers. They were growing and growing. Only 70 went there, but hundreds and thousands came out because God blessed them. So what he tells these midwives, you, you, if it's a male child, you kill them. Now, uh, naturally, these were women. You certainly can tell by their names. Of course, they're feminine. And a woman understands childbirth, and she understands life. And when you tell her to kill a child, you're probably going to have it ricochet right back in your face. Let's see how it goes here. 17. But the midwives feared God. See, they knew better. And did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. They've seen to it. And, and God takes note. God touches the heart of people. God is still on the throne. And God arranges. Verse 18, And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? Why, what are you doing? Verse 19, And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptians, women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. They deliver themselves. They're tough. They can take care of themselves. We weren't there. It wasn't us that did it. Naturally, it was the hand of God taking care of his own. Even the little embryo. How precious our father is until people just simply go so far away from him that then it becomes very difficult. Verse 20, Therefore God dwelt, dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mightily. Uh, they, were, they were growing and growing and growing. Because, why? Just told you, because God intended it. Verse 21, And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, they loved him, that he made them houses. This means God gave them, in the Hebrew tongue, proster prosperity, prosperity, meaning offspring, their own children, their own family. He blessed them also. He had that right and that privilege that he always pays his dues. And when the midwives backed his children, the children of Israel, then God certainly backed them and gave them families of, of their own. You know, we serve a precious father. He's always fair. And anytime you think he has wronged you, you better take account. You better rethink things and look around. Something is amiss. Uh, verse 22. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river. And every daughter you shall save alive. And, and so it was. And naturally here it would be that the one that would end all this, that would lead them out, I'm talking about Moses, would be cast into the river. 
in a little ark by his own mother trying to save a, a beautiful child. And it did. And that child would be the one that we'd be the type of Christ or the type of deliverer, redeemer, that would bring these names, the children of God, from captivity into freedom. Chapter 2 and verse 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi, the priest line, and he took a wife, a daughter of Levi. Verse 2. And the man conceived, and the woman rather conceived, and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Now, um, Moses is the seventh from Abraham, and Abraham was the seventh from Eber, and and um, Enoch the seventh from Adam. And so it is that God controls. But this is a worthy child of the full bloodline of Levi, which means he's a priest um, and um, is qualified to hold that office by birth. Verse 3. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank, went down by that reed, in the reeds, and placed this little ark there. And this, this took, you know, no doubt, she loved this child a great deal. And did God give her a word? It's very possible. It would seem that she knew exactly what she was doing. I could read a lot into that. Bulrushes is papyrus, and papyrus is what the first Bibles were made from. And, and uh, drawing from the water, that's what Moses means in, in the Hebrew tongue and, as, as, uh, and very near the same in the Egyptian tongue, drawn from the water. So here he is. He's in that um, uh, riverbank, verse 4. And his sister, this would be Miriam, of course, stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. I mean, they were watching. That mother had that sister watching, and that little sister is coming along the side of the bank of that river. Five. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. Curiosity, hand of God. Verse 6, And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. She knew who he was. But that one tear from that babe's eye melted the heart of Pharaoh's daughter. And it would be this one and that one tear that would cause Moses to be raised by Pharaoh himself and would bring about the defeat of Pharaoh. That one tear one tear and compassion on that daughter's part. You know, our Heavenly Father has a way that he can change people and uh, he can fill them with compassion. He's in charge. He's in control. And certainly here we have an event. And little old Miriam, she's watching all this. Then verse 7 and then said his sister Miriam to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? I mean, this is really sharp. I mean, you know, naturally it's going to be his own mother. 
verse 8, And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go! And the maid went and called the child's mother, who, who is, um, and naturally the mother's name is, is uh, Jock Abade, uh, Jock Abide. And naturally in the sixth chapter, in the 20 verse, she is named. Okay. Chapter 6, verse 20 of this same book, her name is given. Uh, Full-blood Levite, married to a Levite, and the mother of this child. Uh, what it means, um, uh, Jacobade means um, whose glory uh, is Yah. In other words, all the glory going to God. How strong his hand was upon this one. Verse 9, And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this, child, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. So Pharaoh, through his daughter, paid the wages to raise, to rear Moses, who would be the deliverer from Israel. And so it would be that... Um, it would be accomplished. How precious it is. The hand of our Father. A lot of people might want to call it a hidden hand. It isn't hidden. Not when you, are, not when you have spiritual discernment and you can see the workings of Almighty God, always giving Him credit for that. But uh, so it is. That how precious this could be. That the order was given Throw them in the river. Get rid of them. And here this one little tyke is placed in that ark. Crocodiles and all in that river. And down it comes, that little sister Miriam watching every move. And then uh, Pharaoh's daughter seeing curiosity and then seeing that child, his beautiful face and that tear, and her heart melted. Why? Because God touched her. This was the deliverer of Israel. This was that type of Christ that when that star of Bethlehem came and that babe was in that manger, that the hearts of people were melted. And so it is that God has a way with people how beautiful it is. Don't ever take anything away from that. And here, Pharaoh, because of the compassion of his own daughter, is paying for the rearing of Moses the deliverer. Verse 10, And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. And, and naturally, in Hebrew, it means drawn out of the water. And so it is. That was his name, and that's what his name means. That same water that uh, Pharaoh said, throw all male children into. He rears one of them with even the name Moses, drawn out out of the water, and he will become very fond of this particular child. Verse 11 to continue. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, <clears throat> that he went out unto his brethren, and he looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew one of his brethren. Naturally, the blood's thicker than water, right? Verse 12, And he looked this way and that way. He, he knew it was illegal. And when he saw that there was no man, no Egyptian man or guard, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Uh, he thought that his own people would protect him. I mean, here this guy was brutally driving the children of Israel. And Moses simply looked around and saw there was no other Egyptian 
Bango. He does him in and buries him in the sand. Surely my own people will protect me from this. Don't ever, you don't ever want to count too much on a large group. I, I promise you, you cannot. This is why Jesus in his teaching would say, when you're in a long, large crowd after he fed the multitude, and you gather up the pieces, beware of what you pick up in the crumbs. This is what people say and do and ratchet jaw and talk. Most of, a lot of it will be a bunch of malarkey. And then it is clear in Matthew chapter 16, as it is written, they finally wised up and realized that he was warning them, not because they didn't have bread, but to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That is to say, the Kenites or, that were mixed among them. How precious God's word is that um, he guides and directs. But Moses just did a no-no but you see, the compassion that by the tear when he was a babe, his compassion from his own and in protecting them, he's in a heap of hurt. Okay. He's in a heap of hurt. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 13. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? Why, why are you doing this? You're, you're being driven. You're, you're being crushed by work. And our people will fight each other and let the enemy go free. That is a sad, sad state of affairs. But that is kind of natural among the children. They will fight each other and let the enemy go free. 14, and he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest, killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. In other words, that was against the law. He was in a heap of hurt. And, and naturally it was known. Known big time. His own people. When he was trying to help two of them that are slugging it out because of the hardships, probably, <clears throat> then they turn, this one turns on him. How unfair it can be in a way to be a leader of a people when sometimes it, the fallout is not good on one that tries to bring peace, common sense, and simply the hand of God assisting and bringing those blessings upon those children. These children will come out at the hand of this one, far wealthier than they ever were when they went in. For he is that type of savior that will save this people. Regardless of this act, regardless of one of them uh, coughing him out, so to speak, he will still be that one that delivers. Did God drive him away as he would? And um, um, only uh, that Hebrew, only one of his own children could cop out on him. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 15. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. And of course, Midian means strife. That was, you, it's a good thing for you to know who Midian was, because he's going to marry one of this man's daughters. And many people think that he was an, an Ethiopian. He was not, he was a Midian. And who is a Midianite? A Midianite you will find in the 25th chapter. Is it the 25th or is it the 15th? I'm going to have to look. Of um, Genesis, that uh, Midian was a son of, uh, Moses, of uh, Abraham. 
And so it is. It is the 25th chapter. And this is by Abraham's second wife, Keturah. Sarah had passed on. And um, this was, in other words, this was an Abrahamic child in the land he went to. He went to his own kind. Many people, even Miriam and, and Aaron, will call him on this simply in the sense of a geographical location. But he had every right as a Levite to wed this one uh, daughter of Median in that land of Median. But here he had to leave. Why? Because Pharaoh was going to kill him big time. He had broken Pharaoh's law. Therefore, it was pretty well set, and so it was. Uh, and what, what is important, let's go one more verse to anchor this in, verse 16. Now the priest, now we have an individual. The priest of Median had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. In other words, um, we've got Jethro here. This is, this is who we're talking about. Now, what does this say? If he was a priest, then he had to be a full-blood Abrahamic person. He could not have been mixed or anything else and have been a priest in, in the service of Abraham's children. That will not work. So why am I saying this? Because so many people show their lack of knowledge in the word of God by saying that Moses married an Ethiopian, which they only lived in that geographical area. They were certainly children of Abraham. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you. That's robbery of the true lineage of Almighty God and his children. Okay, that's, um, we'll pick this up in the next lecture. Don't miss it. Bless your heart. The going out into the promised land we're getting there. Hang on. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, church or organization. We will not judge people. You know, we don't have to. We have one judge. It's our Father. That's the only judge you need. It's a sin for anyone else to judge. Spiritual discernment, that is your right to know something is off base and you shouldn't listen to it. Your choice, okay? Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request? You don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Don't you ever, ever let somebody tell you that you can't pray somewhere or at some event. You don't even have to say it out loud. You can pray any time you want to while you're driving a car, while any time. Uh, sitting in a class, you can pray, and no one will even know you're praying except Almighty God, and it pleases Him greatly. 
So uh, you've got to be wiser than the serpent in these end times. But in a sense, as the scripture would go on to say, as peaceful as a dove. A dove is pretty peaceful unless you mess with a mama dove's nest. Then look out. But be wiser than the serpent. He cannot tell you you can't pray. He, he can go shuck it. He can go jump in the river. We're going to pray whenever we want to because we are free citizens of Almighty God. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, we're winning friends and influencing people today. Now we're going to go with Jason from North Carolina. I also thank you for your prop, uh, for your statement. I also have a question about tithes. I think tithes should come out of the profit of what you earn. In other words, if you plant 50 acres of soybeans, you pay for the seed, spray, lime, fuel, repairs on your equipment, to keep going, and a word's going to be cut out there, and what's left, you tithe 10%. If that's incorrect, please advise. You only tithe on what you get. The re you didn't, that wasn't profit, and you didn't make it. That was an expense. Expenses always come out b before um, you have your own, okay? You got, you got to pay your bills. So you are correct. You're doing good. La Militia from California. My question is, when the Holy Spirit is speaking through us, does the entire, this is when you're delivered up before Satan, does the entire world hear us, or is the Antichrist the only one who will hear us? Thank you for answering my question and for all of your work. God bless you. Well, thank you. I appreciate your comment. Uh, of course, those trials are going to be made public around the world. The purpose being, as Christ said, the being that the word can go all the way around the world. That, so naturally, they are very public. And remember also, it's not you speaking, but Almighty God through you, through the Holy Spirit. That's, a, that's going to be a powerful message. Awesome. And... It's going, you know, it's written in Luke 21 that even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say, the Holy Spirit speaking through you. That kind of gives you a clue of how, how awesome that message is going to be. What a time to look forward to. Rick from California. I had to shoot and kill people in the war in Afghanistan. I feel as I may have committed murder but I was defending my country and my unit. Please help me understand. Uh, son, you read uh, Psalms 144. It's a soldier's prayer for God to give you the ability to protect yourself, your group, your nation, and to, and to be on the enemy's neck, okay, which you did, and God says, bless you. So don't, don't you ever give any, don't let some... Uh, Bible thumper leads you down Primrose Lane. You be proud of what you have done to defend this nation that guarantees the freedom for this chapel to have a license to the FCC to broadcast around the world and not infringed on any part and to teach the truth that doesn't come cheap. Yours truly has even fought that battle. And gladly so, because it's well worth it to be able for a government to be, to be forced to allow one to broadcast around the world and have the freedom and the right to do it. It's a precious freedom. You helped maintain it. God bless you. Don't you let anyone put you on a guilt trip over that. And especially don't you yourself put yourself on a guilt trip. W war is not nice. But then there are people in this world that are not nice. You've got to take care of business. Okay? Okay, Peter from North Carolina. Thank you for your, you are so welcome. I know the truth and I will not worship Satan. However, if I am not of the elect, will I still be delivered up for our Father to speak, or will I just 
hold out for five months. No, you'll probably be delivered up. You see, the elect uh, consist of a lot more than 7,000 of God's elect. There is the kings and queens of the ethnos and those with free will. God's going to use, if a person knows the truth and knows what they intend to do, God is going to use you. And that's wonderful. That's as it should be. Uh, Glenda from Texas. I am confused about Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, where it states that Adam knew his wife Eve. She conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man with the help of Yahweh. I believe Satan was Cain's father, but this verse seems to state that Adam is his father. Please explain. It's real simple. You've got to go to the Hebrew in verse 2. It says, you see, the conception took place, the first conception took place back in the third chapter. Then Adam did know his wife, and she conceived again. But when you read verse 2 where it says, again, that word in the Hebrew, yasah, is she continued in labor and gave birth to Abel. So they were twins by separate fathers. That is that is a common, that happens. Um, we have uh, proof of um, dual um, pregnancies by a person having a child of one race and then a child of another race, meaning this girl was impregnated by two different men. Okay, that, that, that happens. Uh, Doug from Arkansas. Where, where in Ezekiel does it talk about the Gulf? I am also a retired Marine. God bless. Simplify. Uh, it's not Ezekiel that talks about the Gulf. It's the book of Luke, chapter 16, in Christ's teachings. He said, in paradise there is a gulf, and all people are there in paradise awaiting judgment. And you know, that upsets some Christians when they think that, well, even the bad people are in paradise? Yeah, on the wrong side. But you know something? They're still your fellow citizens. Do you think maybe in the millennium we might be able to drag a few of them out of there that didn't have an opportunity to hear the truth? Well, I thought everybody could hear the truth. There's a church on every corner. Yep, but what's taught there? Think about that a minute. I'm not being, I'm not being so um, out of line. How many churches teach as Smyrna and Philadelphia who the Kenites are and that you're going to be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan before the end comes? How many of you ever been inside of that teach the truth? And then let me know, okay? Because there are far and few in between, which means there's a lot of people that haven't got a prayer of a chance because they're taught that they're going to fly away. And that's Satan's message when he comes. I've come to fly you out of here. They're going to jump right on his bandwagon and they haven't got a prayer of a chance. But then we have the millennium, a thousand years of teaching. That's not a second chance. They didn't have a chance. Karen from Texas, would you please show scripture that in the first earth age people did something that caused them to be born in the level they are in this earth age? Well, that's real easy. That is so simple. Um, in, and, and you find that in Romans chapter 9 where God makes it very clear. He said, Jacob I loved... Esau, I hated, while they were still embryos in their mother's womb. That happened in the first earth age. And then God himself, uh, why? Because Esau cared not one whit about his birthright, meaning Almighty God. He, he didn't need God. And he always went the opposite direction. So, therefore, um, why? God hated him. That's, that's not a good place to be. You sure don't want to go there. But then in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, God says, I chose the elect before the foundation of this world, age. Meaning they were chosen in the first earth age. Why? They stood against Satan. 
you can read of it in Romans chapter 8 also where some, many were predestined. He said, you don't even know what to pray for. But if you're predestined, God knows what you need to do and he will intercede in your lives. You may wonder, why, well, why am I doing this? Well, he knows and he will always lead you. I'm speaking from Romans chapter 8. Francis from Tennessee, in Revelation chapter 9, verse 5, is that five-month period originally the seven years that Satan is supposed to be here? At uh, Bible class, they are saying that it is still seven years of tribulation and five months is before the tribulation. Would you please explain? Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, we just finished the book, for the elect's sake I have shortened the time. It's shortened from seven years down to five months in basically two, two and a half month periods. Instead of three and a half years in two periods to make seven, it's in two and a half month periods to make five months. Or there wouldn't, this is how good Satan is. There wouldn't be any flesh saved if he was given a full seven years. I mean, look around you today. How many people do you think Satan could just have eating out of his hand, being able to snap his fingers and make lightning come down from heaven and perform miracles supernaturally in front of large crowds? Uh, and the people are not taught that he has these abilities as it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 15. That's what he's going to do. And so, and so you have it. Russell from Indiana. What is going to happen to this dimension when everything goes to the millennium? Well, it changes. We, we go from flesh to spiritual bodies. And um, now, understand the terra firma, meaning the earth does not change on the first day of the millennium. The earth itself does not change until the end of the millennium. Then it will go back to its original, it'll be rejuvenated. Not a new earth, but a new earth age and rejuvenation. God in control. But what happens to this dimension, we simply step from flesh bodies into spiritual bodies. There is a rendition of it that's very hard to understand because it sounds almost cruel in in Zechariah chapter 14, which speaks of that very day when that change happens, and it kind of says it melts like wax, okay, the flesh bodies, so we go to uh, our spiritual bodies. That sounds, don't be afraid, it's our Father, it happens in the twinkle of an eye, boom. Gene from Nebraska, please explain Jeremiah 35 too. Are the Rechabites Kenites? Absolutely. He was their head man. And if so, would you please explain what chapter 35 means, especially when you get down to verse 18 and 19? It shows God's um, appreciation for children that obey their father. And the Rechabites, through Jonadab, who was their king, so to speak. Um, they went to Judah. The purpose of the chapter is to show you that the Kenites went to the tribe of Judah, Jerusalem, and lived for protection so that they could live because people were killing them. They were leeches. And they went there for protection, and they got a real good job. Second Chronicles um, Chapter 2, 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55 de demands that you know they were already keeping books for the tribe of Judah. When, pe when people keep books for you, you better have honest people there that you can trust or strange things happen in the translations. And all God was saying in verse 18 and 19 that they would never want for a man to stand before them because they honored their father. Their father was not God. So you have to give God credit. Even though they were the enemy, he respected 
in other words, he took them in there and said, drink wine. He said, no, we're not going to do it. We, we will not drink wine. It's, we're told not to. And, and uh, that's the story of the Kenite, and so it is. Riley from Alabama, I wanted your opinion on predestination. Well, uh, predestination is just exactly that. God chose some people in the first earth age to be his election. And you can read in the chapter I was quoting earlier, Romans chapter 8, where God makes it very clear. I foreordained you. For ordination means you are ordained to do God's work in this generation. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you are blessed indeed because you are predestined. There's none really predestined. To be predestined is really we never ceased existing, so you didn't pre exist, and you're still doing what you did in the first earth age. So, kind of a little bit of a misnomer, but it does carry through in English that predestination means God had a plan, plan and a purpose. He didn't pick people because they were the prettiest. He picked them because they could cut it, and he knows it. Stephen from Florida. In the Bible, it says that Jesus told the disciples to go out uh, without begging bags. When a church asks for donations, isn't that the same as a begging bag? No, a, a servant is worthy of his hire, okay? I, I don't want to say that uh, church, uh, however, they, I will not allow a plate to be passed in any meetings I ever hold. But there is always a box at the back of the room because buildings have to be paid for and so on and so forth. But that's private. That's people's business. But I would not call taking an offering begging because you have the privilege of giving or not giving. So um, uh, begging is where uh, people will get a mailing list of, say, senior citizens and send them some big long letter about you need to send money to this church today. You're near the, your deathbed. You need to buy your way into heaven. Send us $500 so we can put your name on that list. Well, they're lying to you. That is, t that is really begging. A bunch of hypocrites. You cannot buy your way into heaven. They're, that's impossible. You make your way there because God loves you and you love him. So uh, that, that's what a beggar is. But a church passing, taking an offering, I, I wouldn't put it in that category, all right? It's like you're not to muzzle the ox, which means what? Well, if you're working that old boy and he's out in the corn patch, you know, and if he reaches down and gets a little bite, well, you know, he earns it. He's pulling that plow that you're walking behind. And he, he's earned that, so you don't begrudge him that, all right? J.R. from Ohio, a preacher told me that if you deny the rapture, then you are denying the resurrection of Christ. Whoopee. This pastor also said that in his opinion, if someone has epilepsy, then they have a demonic spirit, and I have epilepsy. Are these things true? Absolutely not. He's doing a job on you or he's trying to that will not quit. He is a liar. I don't often call a man that, but this is blatant. Okay. Um, the rapture, the word rapture is not even in God's word. It's in some preacher's mouths. But the word is not in the Bible. Therefore, how can you deny something that doesn't exist? And, but you certainly are not going to deny the resurrection of Christ, for we know he rose. And epilepsy is when someone is damaged at birth or, or through some other method, it is an illness, and there is treatment for it today. There are evil spirits in the world, but there's also illnesses in the world. You've got to, a real minister of God's word will be able to discern one from the other. This man does not have spiritual discernment. Be very, very careful. He's playing with you. 
Roy from Louisiana. Since we are created in the image of our spiritual bodies, does that mean there are giants in heaven since the fallen angels created giants when they impregnated women? What are your thoughts? No, those were, those were hybrids. It was not part of God's plan. He didn't create them. When the fallen angels left their place of habitation, naturally, in as much they were male. And naturally, when they left their habitation, as much as male was made in their image, angels' food will sustain a flesh body. It meant they had the ability to impregnate a woman. But it wasn't natural. So they were all hybrids. God did not, he destroyed them. That's what we had the flood for was to destroy the Gibar. Sharon from Virginia. My boyfriend has a daughter who is autistic. Will she be automatically saved or will she be judged by what her parents do? No one will ever be judged by what their parents do. As it is written in the 31st chapter of the great book of Deuteronomy, verse 29, if the father bites a sour grape, it's not going to set the children's teeth on edge, meaning you don't answer for your father's sins and your father doesn't answer for yours. But she will be considered innocent and will have an opportunity to know in the millennium everything, and possibly even here. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it. it makes his day when you make his. Boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offering. If we have helped you, and only if we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God, he will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me, listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. Ezra and Nehemiah, these two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk. Instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Let's talk for a moment. We're talking about horses of the Bible. And I want to say there are many things on this subject we just don't know. But we do gather from our Father's Word. And let's recap just a little bit what we discovered in the first uh, lecture on this subject. And that was that in the first chapter of Ezekiel, the color amber in the Hebrew is highly polished bronze.